so um, I know quite a few of you already, which is great. Um, and I'm going to start with essentially what John's just said. So um, a little bit more about me. So I did the X to GP training scheme. I finished last summer um, and stayed on at Clare House, which is where I did my ST3 year um, with John as my trainer. Um, so I do six sessions there. Um, five of them are just normal GP sessions. I do an afternoon, a month of contraception. So cause and implants and one of my sessions per week is actually as the care home doctor so I go and visit um, our three care homes and essentially do a bit of a ward round which is quite nice actually um, and nice to do something a little bit different. Um, I've kind of developed a few special interests along the way and they're all very much in their infancy um, kind of just trying to have a bit of a mix of a career um, going forward just to keep interest going really. So the women's health stuff I started when I was an ST2, ST3 so I did the Dr Cog and the FSRH diploma and got my um, coils and implants done during training and managed to get a bit of funding for that which was really helpful um the care home stuff kind of came out of a qi project which i did in st3 um which essentially was making all the care homes have one gp um, and trying to put the work on one person rather than three different gps from the practice visiting each lunchtime or having a gp from our practice and a gp from the practice down the road meeting each other at the care home at lunchtime and kind of doing a bit of unnecessary work um so that's continued and that's been quite good um i do a bit of stuff on genomics which is a little bit random so i do a couple of sses for the med school on genomic medicine in primary care so we do a few tutorials on genomics and then they essentially sit in gp clinics um and it went okay last year so i'm doing that again this year um and that's based off a of master's that i did a few years ago on genomics at exeter um so a bit random but quite interesting and quite nice to do a bit of teaching um and also trying to get involved as a PGG tutor with the med school um, to do a bit more teaching and kind of get a bit more in that direction. Um, and then the menopause stuff is, is what I've started most recently. So there's a, a special study unit with the Faculty for Sexual and Reproductive Health where you can become a, a kind of specialist in the menopause and eventually accept NHS referrals. So that's a bit more of a kind of long term plan. Um, not quite sure how it all fits together yet, but hopefully we will make something work. So in terms of this afternoon, I thought I'd talk a bit about menopause slash that's what John wanted me to cover. Um, so I'm going to do a bit of a brief overview and then just give you some of your best current options for prescribing, because I think the formula actually isn't that helpful for menopause. It's a bit confusing if you dare to open the BNF to look at HRT. It's awful. Um, so actually, it'd just be nice for you to have um, a bit of info in terms of what to tell patients about risks and a couple of options that you can try in the first instance. Um, and Actually, in the future, if you've ever got any questions, I'm very happy to be emailed about stuff. Um, just because I'm, it's, a, it's an ongoing process of learning this stuff. And actually, if you've got any complex or interesting cases, I'd be very happy to try and help with those. So do get in touch. Um, and then at the end, we'll just go through a few questions from you guys. So if you've got anything menopause or just women's health related or kind of um, if you're thinking about special interests early on in your career, then happy to chat about that too. And do just interrupt me with questions along the way. So I can see a few people on the side of my screen, but um, can't see you all. So feel free just to butt in if, um, if you want me to clarify anything or whatever. Um, so kind of cracking on with the menopause. So a few terms that are quite confusing to us and quite confusing to patients. And actually, I think whatever word they use, they're all essentially talking about the same thing. So the menopause itself is a re retrospective diagnosis one year after your last period. Uh, the perimenopause is, is kind of the time when you've not yet finished your periods or not yet got to the one year past your last period and you're having menopausal symptoms. Um, and actually, I think patients will use menopause slash perimenopause pretty much kind of um, interchangeably and not really be sure what they mean. And then postmenopausal, so that's one year after your last period kind of for the rest of your life, essentially, um, where you may or may not have menopausal symptoms. Um, so it's a bit confusing in terms of terminology. It actually only really makes a difference in terms of your prescribing, whether someone is still having periods or whether they are at that one year past their last period point. But otherwise, I think just pick a word and use that with your patients and it doesn't really matter. Um, I tend to go for just kind of menopause, actually, to cover all of it. Um, so some statistics. So the average age of the menopause in the UK is 51 and a half years. 
Um, symptoms can last a variable amount of time, so averages between four and seven years, but actually in 10% of women it can go on for even longer and that's up to 12 years. 75% of women get vasomotor symptoms, so your hot flushes, um, and 25% of those have symptoms that are so severe and affect their quality of life, and that's largely in terms of kind of sleep, um, being up all night because they are hot and sweaty, etc. So diagnosis, so it's actually a clinical diagnosis, as I'm sure you know, um, in those of a kind of appropriate age with classic symptoms. Um, and we'll, we'll list a few of those symptoms a li little bit further on. Um, but if they're less than 45 and they've got symptoms that are suggestive of the menopause, then you can consider a blood test, which is for FSH levels. So FSH, as I'm sure you remember, um, gets negative feedback from oestrogen. So as your oestrogen levels go down, your FSH levels slowly go up. And so you can do a test for that. But during the menopause, your hormones are all over the place. And so that FSH level can kind of go up and down quite dramatically. So in someone who is a typical age for the menopause, there's no point checking it because you don't really know what you're getting from that one snapshot in time. If you are going to check it in people less than 45, then you want to do two levels um, taken four to six weeks apart and you're looking for levels greater than 30. Um, you kind of do want to consider it if someone's got symptoms um, suggestive of the menopause and they're below 40 because it is important to pick up on uh, premature ovarian insufficiency um, because they do need HRT for bone protection up until um, the average age of the menopause, which is 51 and a half. So um, in terms of if someone's on contraception already and you're thinking about measuring an FSH, remember that oestrogen suppress it. So if someone's on combined hormonal contraception, then actually you won't get an accurate reading. Um, also, the depo being a really high dose of progesterone can um, reduce your FSH. So if you're on a depo, generally you can't measure an FSH, but sometimes you can if you measure it right at the end of their 12 weeks, just before they get their, ne their next depo injection, that can give you a slightly better um, reading for the FSH in terms of whether it's raised or not. So when is it safe to start HRT? So generally within 10 years of the onset of any menopausal symptoms or up to the age of 60, um, as in this group, the benefits generally outweigh the risks. And we'll go through a few of those benefits and risks a little bit later. Um, and as I mentioned in premature um, ovarian insufficiency, then HRT should be prescribed to all women until 51, um, which is largely for bone protection to protect against osteoporosis. Can you just give them like this hospital, or is that is that not? So you something? could potentially, but you'd have to go down the route of like um, your fracs and your Q Q fracture scores and see whether they need a DEXA. Um, I think probably they would also have other symptoms that you'd, you'd want to get on top of, like flushes and mood changes and maybe a bit of anxiety. And actually, HRT is probably an all-round better option. Um, but if someone was put into the menopause because of say breast cancer and treatment for that or um, a procedure where they had uh, ovaries removed for whatever reason and they went into um, very early menopause and you couldn't use HRT because of whatever cancer or whatever's underlying it then yeah you would consider that as bone protection alongside probably something else to make them feel better yeah um so in terms of risks and benefits so there's lots of benefits to HRT um mainly symptom control so guessing and uh, guessing on top of your hot flushes improvements in mood and concentration um systemic hrt can improve vaginal dryness but there's also um kind of vaginal specific hrt which is really safe and very good for those symptoms um it can improve aches and pains and itchiness which are other symptoms of um, menopause and brain fog as well um, as we've mentioned, you can also very much reduce the risk of osteoporosis by um, giving people a bit of oestrogen. Um, and there's, there's good evidence that it actually can kind of improve your chances of um, not getting things like type 2 diabetes. And before the age of 60, it's actually thought to have cardiovascular benefits um, rather than risk, which um, is something that I've kind of learned through doing all of this. Um, so risk, so the breast, the risk of breast cancer is slightly increased but I've got a picture on the next page that kind of shows you those increased risks in comparison with things like obesity and alcohol which actually are probably more risky. Um, 
risk of, of VTE, so P's and DVTs, that's actually with the oral route only. So transdermal oestrogen has no increased risk of VTE, um, which is a really good thing to think about in patients that do have some VTE risk factors already, such as being overweight. Um, and there is a risk of stroke, but it, this is very small um, in comparison to kind of the general population. And actually, if you're thinking of people in their late 40s and 50s to 60, they've actually got quite a small risk of stroke um, to start with. So the, the very small increased risk is not something that would stop you using it. So this is a kind of helpful picture showing your risks of breast cancer. So um, the top bar of just all the blue people is your kind of general risk um, without HRT if you're a healthy person in the UK. Um, if you add in some HRT next down, that's an additional four cases of breast cancer. Um, there's some interesting thought about oestrogen only HRT. So that actually can reduce your risk of breast cancer. Um, there's only a certain lucky few that can have oestrogen only HRT. And that's if you don't have a uterus. Um, so kind of actually an irrelevant fact for most people that you'll be managing um, in terms of HRT. Then we look at a few other different things. So the combined pill can increase your risk. Having alcohol, so two or more units per day, increases your risk more than HRT and more than the combined pill. And then smokers, obviously that increases the risk. We all know that. And if you look down, so um, the one up from the bottom row, so that's obesity. So an extra 24 cases of women with a BMI greater than 30. And a BMI greater than 30 isn't that massive. I think we've probably got a lot of patients that have a BMI greater than 30. And that's a huge increased risk for breast cancer um, compared to HRT. And interestingly, if you're obese and you've got that risk of breast cancer, actually adding in HRT doesn't really increase the risk much further. Um, the large amount of risk just comes from being obese. But in those people, you should probably think of um, transdermal estrogen anyway, because they have that increased VTE risk because they're obese. So big people generally go for a transdermal estrogen if you can get them to take it. So things that you might hear um, either through things that you read or what patients go on Google and read and then come in requesting um, is two terms, body identical and bioidentical. Um, and they sound ridiculously similar. So body identical is essentially regulated hormones that are produced by the pharma pharmaceutical industry and are the ones that we can prescribe. So they're the ones that are on our formula in the, um, in the BNF. So your estrogen comes in various names, which are essentially the same thing. So your estradiol or 17 beta estradiol, which is chemically known as E2. And that's the most kind of biological active, biologically active form of your estrogen. And then the most, um, body identical form of progesterone is one called micronized progesterone which is essentially progesterone put into a form that can be absorbed through an oral route because progesterone is generally not very well absorbed um, then your bioidentical hormones are unregulated so nothing that we can prescribe they're used generally by the private sector and so patients kind of googling HRT private clinics may come across this offer of bioidentical HRT where the clinics will say we can analyse your saliva or um, whatever sample and we can work out exactly what hormone composition you need and then they make this plant-based hormones which is is kind of a mix of progesterones and estrogens and testosterones and all kind of things that might make you feel good but aren't something that we can offer on the NHS and not something that are to be recommended I would say. Um, I think people, women get a bit of fear reading that some HRT comes from um, horses we, so the equine HRT, which actually is on our formulary, um, probably because it's quite cheap, but actually I would just go for the other stuff, which is the kind of regulated body identical hormone. And you can use that term with them because it, it is you know, manufactured to be as similar to the stuff that we would produce naturally and it's regulated, you know exactly what you're getting. Um, so if people come in with these terms, just try and act like you know a bit about it and say, no, I'm not giving you your bioidentical hormone, I'm going to give you body identical hormones. Um, yeah, because they may come in with that. So he needs what? So be because they're losing the oestrogen, that's 
everybody needs estrogen um, and anyone who's got a uterus also requires some progesterone which is for endometrial protection against endometrial cancer there's two exceptions here so if you had endometriosis and you've had a hysterectomy you may still have some endometrial tissue endometrial tissue present so it's worth just kind of looking at the op note maybe considering contacting their surgeon or actually just giving them some progesterone anyway if they had particularly severe endometriosis so that's one just to be cautious with so if they've got endometrial deposits elsewhere they are at risk from unopposed oestrogen of developing cancer of those little patches and then women that have had a partial hysterectomy so if you've got a cervical stump present you can still have some endometrial cells there you can do a bit of a challenge here so if you give a three-month trial of some cyclical progesterone and then they get a bleed that confirms that they've got some endometrial tissue present and therefore they need ongoing progesterone and if they don't bleed then you can assume that they don't have any endometrial tissue and you can just give them oestrogen only HRT. So what types of HRT have we got? So the two that you are all aware of that come with a few different names themselves. So you've got your cyclical or sequential HRT, which gives you a bleed. And then you've got your continuous or continuous combined HRT, which doesn't give you a bleed. So looking at the top one, so the cyclical HRT is where you have oestrogen all the time, but you have progesterone for some of the cycle. And that then leads to a bleed when you're not taking the progesterone. And that's a predictable bleed. And women that are still having periods or are kind of within the last the year since having their last period, um, they need to have cyclical HRT to give a predictable bleed. Um, and that's generally because at that time, hormones are all over the place and the endometrium is thought to be unstable due to those hormone fluctuations. And you're trying to kind of stabilise things by giving them progesterone for part of the cycle and letting them have a bleed. And then your continuous HRT, so that's where you just have your estrogen, your progesterone for the whole of the cycle, and you shouldn't get any bleeding. You can do in the first few months of starting HRT, and that's kind of normal. If it's continuing past about six months, then you'd want to look into why that's happening. Um, and think about your kind of two-week wait, um, postmenopausal bleeding, referral, etc. So you can use your continuous um, combined HRT if they are postmenopausal, so if it's been a year since their last period, um, or if they've been on the cyclical HRT for a year, um, you can switch over. So the continuous HRT is thought to be safer for your endometrium because you're giving it that progesterone protection for the whole month. Um, but there isn't actually a definite rule over when to stop over, and some people don't mind having that kind of predictable bleed on the cyclical HRT. So actually nice say so that you can continue the cyclical um, form up to 54 and then swap over um, or do it after a year. So it's a, a bit of a kind of discussion with your patient as to what they fancy doing. So in terms of kind of what we've covered so far, here are your top options. So an ideal option is your transdermal oestrogen. So that would be a patch or a gel plus some micronized progesterone. So that's your body identical, closest thing to the natural progesterone that you can prescribe or use a transdermal oestrogen plus a marina coil. And that then gives you kind of localized endometrial protection for a period of five years. And you can use both of these options kind of anywhere along the menopause timeline. So whether they need cyclical or whether they can have the continuous HRT. So if they need it as a cyclical um, form of HRT, then you can just use the micronized progesterone for 14 days of the month at a slightly higher dose taken at night. Or if it's a continuous um, form of HRT that's needed, then you just give the progesterone every day alongside the oestrogen every day. And if you've got a marina, then it's just the same whether you think they'd need continuous or cyclical HRT because you just keep it in the whole time. A bit more on micronized progesterone. So its um, prescribed name is Utrogestan. Um, and as we said, it's the most similar progesterone to the one that we produce ourselves. Um, it can be taken orally or vaginally. So it comes in oral capsules and vaginal capsules. The vaginal capsules are much more expensive and they're generally used by fertility clinics for kind of avoiding miscarriage in IVF pregnancies. But actually you can use the oral capsules as a vaginal capsule um, and that then makes it kind of cheaper for us to prescribe and it's largely dependent on 
whether the patient is happy to do so or not. So taken orally, it, it can give you a bit of drowsiness. So it's taken at night time. That can be quite helpful for women who are struggling to sleep. Um, but if they kind of end up with slightly increased progesterone side effects, so kind of breast tenderness or feeling excessively sleepy, then they could try the vaginal route. And you essentially just kind of put one capsule in per day and it's absorbed well enough to give you the endometrial protection that route. So you kind of you can give patients the choice on that. Um, it's taken at night because it makes you sleepy. Um, the cyclical dose is double the strength. So you take 200 at night for 14 days of the month. Um, and you can just tell people to do it on a calendar month, day one to 14 of each month. And that's fine to do. Um, and that's what you do if they're within a, a year of their last period or if they're still bleeding. And then the continuous dose is the lower dose one, so 100 at night time um, if they are postmenopausal. Um, in terms of micronized progesterone versus kind of older progesterone, so like your um, medroxy progesterone or your norethisterone, um, it's got better risks of um, breast cancer, so lower risk of breast cancer, lower risk of cardiovascular disease and lower risks of um, VTE. Um, and that's because all the other progesterones that we can prescribe are largely derived from testosterone. They've got a very similar chemical structure, um, whereas micronized progesterone isn't. It's just a, a progesterone. A um, bit more on the marina. So the marina is a really great option and it's licensed for five years as a contraceptive um, for treatment of he heavy um, uterine bleeding which actually can happen um, around the time of the menopause and it's also licensed for five years as the progesterone component of HRT for your endometrial protection. Um, its license over COVID was actually extended to six years but that was just for the contraceptive element so if you've got someone who's in their sixth year and they're using it as the progesterone component of HRT then they do actually need extra progesterone on top until you can change it over so you can just add in the oral utrogestan for that year until it, you can change it um and as yeah as i've said so uh, menorrhagia is quite common around the menopause so it's a good it's a good option if someone is having heavy bleeding on another note, so if you're using your marina just for contraception and it's inserted over the age of 45, it can be left in until the age of 55. Um, but it does need to be within its five year license if you then decided to use it as your progesterone part of HRT. Um, but if, if they're not wanting HRT and they just want contraception, um, their last coil can go in at 45 and stay in until 55. But then make sure that they don't um, forget to have it taken out because you wouldn't want to leave it in there forever. So which oestrogen to use? So um, I've talked a bit about how the transdermal oestrogen is your better option um, in terms of kind of being less risky, particularly for BTE. Um, all patches actually are matrix patches. So that means that the drug is kind of in the whole of the patch rather than being a in a little reservoir kind of in the middle of the patch. And that means that you can cut up your patches quite safely so that the dose can be adjusted and, and patients can actually almost adjust the dose themselves um, to see what kind of suits them the best. So Everol is the patch that's on our formulary um, and that can be used first line. It's actually quite a big patch, so it's good for chopping it up, um, but not so great if someone's worried about a really unsightly um, patch on their skin in summer, whatever. So if they are worried about something being too big, then Estroduct is a really tiny patch, um, so easily covered up. But you would probably have to stick with the dose that it comes in because they're quite small, so harder to chop up. Um, all patches are available in 25, 50, 75 and 100. Um, the formula suggests starting at 50 and then kind of going up or down at the three month review. And, and that seems pretty sensible. Um, you put on one patch twice a week, just swap it over, ideally kind of below the level of the breasts, but you can put it anywhere really um, and rotate the sites. Some people do have skin reactions to the patches, so just try a different brand um, and see if they get on with something better. Um, gel, so there's a couple of different gels. There's just plain Estragel or there's Sandrina, which comes in sachets. Um, and I've just put down the equivalent doses. So two to four measures, um, uh, two measures of Estragel is equivalent to a 50 microgram patch, which is equivalent to two milligrams of oral um, Estradiol or um, Sandrina comes in 500 micrograms and one milligram. So you can just convert that to kind of the, what you'd get as an oral dose essentially. Um, if your patients do want an oral option, because actually lots of people don't really fancy the idea of putting a patch on or rubbing a gel on. Um, and actually just a note on the gel, it's a bit of a faff. So you 
take it out of your sachet or you pump it onto your hand and then you have to smear it. Um, most people tend to do it on the thighs. Don't rub it in. Um, can't really touch anybody for an hour. Uh, got to let it dry, blah, blah, blah. So it just seems a bit of a faff in terms of lifestyle. So patches are probably easier to tolerate than gels. Um, and even then, some people just find that they do lots of swimming or lots of sports and they fall off. So you, um, I think we do have to support those that want an oral option and just discuss that it is slightly riskier. Um, so on our formulary, the top of the list is Premarin, which is the equine oestrogen. It does come from uh, horses urine unfortunately and I think that does put people off I've not had particularly great experience with trying it in the past but um, maybe some people get on with it fine um, so I would just go for a less solo which is on our formulary as well um, and if I was going to use an oral option I'd actually just go for um, the Alest solo plus Utrogestan um, so two oral tablets would be the better combination in terms of risk, but you can use some of the combined options that are on our formulary if you really have to, like if a, if a patient doesn't want to take two different tablets, or you can use a less solo um, in combination with a marina as well. Um, Zoominon is a only very slightly more expensive option than a less solo. It's the same drug and it comes in the same strengths. Um, and I've just put that on there in case a less solo isn't available. Um, as there was lots of HRTs shortages last year, so good to know a couple of different names. In terms of combined options, so if you do want to use a tablet that has both your oestrogen plus progesterone, then Femiston is actually one of your kind of better ones in terms of risk profile. So it's got a progesterone called didrogesterone, which is actually a kind of chemical isomer of progesterone. So not too dissimilar to the kind of body identical um, micronized progesterone. And because of that, it comes with um, a better breast cancer risk pro type, pro profile. Um, so that's a kind of good option. And I think that one is actually on our formulary, which is, is very helpful. So in terms of contraception, you, you have to remember that HRT is not a contraceptive unless you've got a marina. Um, those that are less than 50, and perhaps if they don't kind of have really severe menopausal symptoms, you can actually use the combined pill as an option for HRT and contraception. So it is essentially progesterone and oestrogen. It would be free on prescription because it's a contraceptive rather than having to pay for HRT. Um, and actually that's something worth considering up until 50. The FSRH do suggest that at 50 you need to swap away from a combined hormonal contraception and then you could offer them the more kind of classical HRT options. Um, if you truly know that a woman's postmenopausal, so if, if she can give a definite history um, of her last period being a year ago, um, then contraception is no longer needed. But otherwise, generally, contraception is continued until the age of 55, where you can kind of assume that she will no longer be able to get pregnant. Um, and you can stop, stop it then. So what contraception can you use? So we talked a lot about the marina, which is a great option all round. Um, you can add in the progesterone only options on top of your HRT. So your implant, your progesterone only pill and your depot injection can all be used alongside your HRT. And you do have to remember that they still need the progesterone component of HRT because none of these progesterones um, the contraceptive ones are actually licensed for the endometrial protection um, but you can add them in which does seem a bit silly I think but you still need to do that in terms of kind of covering yourself medically legally. Combined hormonal contraception so it can be used instead of HRT but not on top of HRT so if you if they're really keen on some HRT and they still need a contraceptive then use one of your progesterone only options or, or kind of try and do a bit of a hard sell on the marina. Stopping contraception, so um, one year after your last period, if they're not on any contraception, nothing's muddying the water, then you can just stop contraception. Um, otherwise, generally methods are continued up until 55. If someone is on a progesterone only option and they're amenorrheic and not having any periods and they're over 50, you can consider um, checking an FSH level. If that comes back a greater than 30, just one isolated reading, then continue the method for one more year and then they can stop after that. But if the FSH level isn't raised, you have to continue it for a year and then just recheck the FSH level and then kind of um, 
make a plan from there essentially um and this these tables are from the fsrh contraception over 40s guide which is is really helpful um, and as we've said if a murrain is inserted over 45 it can stay in until 55 if it's just used for contraception and also um that's that's a cover for heavy menopausal bleeding or heavy menstrual bleeding sorry um i guess because your periods will have stopped at some point along the way so hopefully the heavy menopause the heavy menstrual bleeding will have stopped too so just a slide on vaginal oestrogen so it's really safe and it can be continued long term and it can be used alongside your systemic hrt um it's probably going to become something that you can just buy over the counter at the pharmacy um through our careers because it's thought to be so safe um and it's great for a whole host of symptoms so um not just kind of discomfort or um recurrent utis but people that kind of women that get up in the night to go for a wee urinary frequency any symptom in that area can generally be helped by a bit of topical estrogen um because there's loads of estrogen receptors around that area if you don't give them estrogen they kind of die out and everything goes a bit dry and horrible so actually encouraging vaginal estrogen um early on is a great thing to do and actually everybody will get kind of atrophy um if if you don't really do anything about it and for some people that can be quite uncomfortable so it can give quite a bit of quality of life improvement so just talking about it is a great thing to do um actually the dose is incredibly low so a year's worth of vaginal estrogen is equivalent to just one tablet that's not one tablet per day that's one tablet in the entire year so um if people are worried about kind of each systemic absorption of estrogen it's such a tiny dose um and it's really really safe so the things on our formula are perfectly great um so you've got the cream um and pessaries which are used essentially on the same sort of kind of dosing schedule so you use them every day for two weeks and then you reduce it to twice a week um the formula does suggest reviewing at 12 weeks but actually this is is great to continue in the long term if you've got very elderly people um so perhaps people in care homes who are struggling with kind of vaginal discomfort um or frequent utis etc then there is a an estrogen ring um it's a bit softer than the kind of classic pessary that you'd use in prolapse um but it's inserted in much the same way and it can last up to 12 weeks um and actually if people ever ask whether they can have sex with that in yes they can it doesn't need to be taken out um and just useful to know that using vaginal estrogen in the early days can cause a bit of thrush so just give them treatment ask them to persist and normally it settles down so testosterone comes up a little bit um if you're looking at stuff about hrt so it's considered second line for kind of loss of sexual desire and sexual problems um but actually first line is still hrt um it's only really if they have not had success with hrt and kind of lots of dose adjustments trying different options that you would consider it. and it's not really something you can do as a gp um there are a few menopause specialists around the country that can prescribe it and, and potentially thinking about going to them for advice but actually we're at a bit of a loss in devon in terms of kind of specialist menopause clinics to go to for advice on this um which hopefully won't be the case forever um yeah so it's not something that we really can do and i think you'd have to have a really strong argument for prescribing it in primary care and i probably wouldn't do it without asking for advice from someone um to be honest but i think generally sexual desire is influenced by so many different things um there's lots of psychological basis to sexual function so i just try and target all of that and um see if hrt can make things a little bit better for them rather than easily going in for testosterone Um, so previous breast cancer actually is is fairly common now, I suppose, with it being very very treatable. Um, but for us, HRT is still contraindicated in breast cancer, so we can't prescribe it. Um, there is evidence that vaginal estrogen is okay because you essentially don't absorb any of it; it's just used very locally. Um, but it should only be prescribed if non-hormonal treatments, so lubes and moisturisers, haven't helped. And I think seeking advice from the patient's um, oncologist or cancer specialist, breast specialist, breast specialist, whatever, um, is really important to do. Um, just another note: so um, you can use SSRIs as an alternative to HRT for things like hot flushes, but two of them, paroxetine and fluoxetine, do interact with tamoxifen which is used for five years after some breast cancers 
and um, these two SSRIs can reduce the effectiveness of tamoxifen, so don't use them. Benlafaxine would be your best option, um, and that gives improvement um, in about 50% of women. So it's, it's worth a try if you've got someone on tamoxifen who's really struggling with hot flushes. So what are your other options? So CBT kind of comes top of the list for pretty much everything, I think, in the, in medicine these days. Um, but there is some fairly good evidence that it, it can be helpful for those struggling with menopausal symptoms. SSRIs are a reasonable option. So HRT is generally first line for any menopausal symptom. Um, but SSRIs can give a bit of benefit in things like particularly like hot flushes or um, if they've also got a bit of kind of concurrent anxiety or depression with their menopause. You can get some benefit with that. Um, there's a bit of evidence for yoga and Tai Chi. I think, you know, anything that helps people to exercise um, is is very useful, isn't it? Um, so you can recommend that too. The herbal options. So these are kind of non-regulated things, but people will try them. So having a bit of a pragmatic approach to people who want to use these things is sensible. So just ensure that they buy them from a reputable shop like Holland and Barrett, et cetera, um, and advising that they buy several months worth in a go just so that they get kind of consistent dosing. Um, and if you get them to monitor the symptoms, so if they have some improvement, then it's reasonable to continue if they're not getting any improvement, but they're developing weird rashes or tummy pain or whatever, then probably sensible to stop them. So just a bit of a summary. So I think menopause is, you know, affects 51% of the population. You'll see a lot of it in your clinic. Women of a menopausal age coming in with weird and wonderful symptoms that you can't quite put together. Um, just think in the back of your mind, could this actually be menopausal symptoms? Um, is it worth kind of talking about that a bit more, maybe doing a bit of a trial of HRT? Um, as we've talked about the safest option in terms of kind of your breast cancer risk and your risk of VT is actually your transdermal estrogen plus your micronized progesterone used orally. Um, HRT is really safe to start within 10 years of the menopause um, and up to age of 60. After this, it's not completely contraindicated, but the cardiovascular risks are higher. So it's just about having a discussion with the patient and you can continue it beyond then if they are are very adamant at doing so as long as they do understand that their kind of risks of heart disease stroke etc and breast cancer will be a bit higher after that age mm -hmm. um in premature ovarian insufficiency it's really important that hrt um, is continued until at least 51 years of age for the bone protection uh, and they can of course continue it longer than that if they um, want to for kind of symptom control in terms of when you started your HRT, so you want to review them at three months. Um, you can tweak the dose of estrogen if it's needed. Um, generally, the progesterone should kind of stay the same forever, really. Um, but if bleeding actually is problematic, you can increase the progesterone. Um, so you can go up to 200 every day of the utrogestan, or you can swap to a different progesterone. So the slightly older fashioned um, medroxy progesterone is a reasonable option that has slightly better control of bleeding if they are having lots of bleeding problems with the utrogestan. Um, but that is slightly um, a higher risk in terms of breast yeah. cancer. Um, if they're happy on their treatment, then you just review them yearly, ideally with a bit of a chat about kind of any changes in cardiovascular risk factors, checking their weight, thinking about their blood pressure, etc. Um, if they are settled on the HRT, so kind of post six months of being on something or post six months of, of a dose change, then just tell them that they really need to report any new bleeding um, so that you can kind of refer as appropriate for um, endometrial pathology by the two week wait mm -hmm. pathways. And then my last slide is just a slide on some of the resources, which are quite good. Um, so I'll just tell you about a couple. So the top one, the Primary Care Women's Health Forum is uh, for GPs and it's got loads of useful guidance. Um, so there's one that I've put a link for, which is a PDF on kind of um, HRT prescribing for GPs. Um, my menopause doctor is a, a GP called Louise Newsom, who is kind of she was a GP now she's just a private menopause doctor but she does have a, a couple of useful things on her website um MIMS HRT table that's actually quite good in terms of looking at brands to prescribe um if you want a certain kind of hormone in there because the FSF RH guidance does sometimes suggest that certain hormones are better for kind of certain risk groups or certain ages and actually MIMS can tell you exactly what brand it is that would have those hormones in so that can be quite helpful um the formulary as you all know and then um, 
you've got your FSRH guidance, which gives you kind of contraception over 40s. So that's a really useful document. Um, the British Menopause Society, again, has a few useful tools. And Rock My Menopause is kind of more patient directed, but it does have a few um, a few things on there that are quite helpful. So it's got a template that patients can fill in before they see their GP for a menopause consultation. And it's got a kind of um, a, like a little flow chart of do you have any medical problems? What's your blood pressure? What's your weight? Do you take any over the counter medicines? So it's kind of a the patient can gather all the stuff that would be relevant for a menopause consultation and then come to you with that. Um, so, for instance, if someone rang you, you could say, Okay, so about my menopause, here's an AccuRx link, fill this in and then come back to me and we can have a chat about kind of HRT, etc., going forward. Um, has anybody got any questions, menopause related, uh, women's health related, contraception related, um, anything else related? Oh, that's a good question. <clears throat> Hello, Helen. Hi, Lorna. Um, so this is maybe a really stupid question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, you know, with um, the transdermal, if you want to give them a transdermal estrogen and uh, micronized progesterone, with the um, combined, but um, not by the uh, the sequential versus the continuous, yeah. um, you just give the the estrogen transdermal bit is the same throughout. It's not doesn't change throughout the cycle. That it's only the progesterone that is either continuous or cyclical is that right yeah exactly so your estrogen you kind of pick one and stick with that and the dose is the same throughout the whole month and it's just the progesterone um it is slightly confusing that the micronized progesterone has two different doses depending on whether you're using it cyclically or um right. continually but it's effectively you use half the dose if you're giving it the whole time and you double the dose because you're halving the amount of time so over the month they kind of get the exact amount of progesterone you're just doing at slightly different levels but yeah the estrogen stays exactly the same the whole time great thank you <laughs> I finally get my head around um hrt prescribing which is so great. um with the gel some women will adjust the dose themselves so because it's kind of two pumps to four pumps they may find that actually at certain parts of the month they feel a bit more symptomatic or they have slightly more flushes and so they can kind of tweak the dose of that themselves and i think that's that's okay to do. Um, the patch, I guess you could do something similar, but you'd be chopping them about a bit. So I think in terms of the gel being a bit of a faff, that probably is its benefit that you can kind of tweak the dose a little bit depending on your symptoms. And if a patient had like, say, oh, I'm having a bad few days of symptoms and I want to increase my estrogen, will that work very quickly for them? It could, to, uh, help it's it? worth a try. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Um, Harry, I saw you had your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to ask a slightly similar question. So um, did you say for people who need to be on a cyclical treatment, they can they can have the myrena as the progesterone element? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, definitely. They, they, would, they, would they get regular periods with that? Because it's kind of obviously there's no fluctuation in dosage there. No. So... With that, you're you're protecting your endometrium by having kind of progesterone there the whole time. You're making it stable because the marina effectively kind of thins down the lining of the womb over the first three to six months of it being there. Um, and bleeding is kind of random. So some people end up with quite light regular periods. Some people end up with irregular periods and some people end up with no periods whatsoever kind of like rough rule of thirds, really. Um, the only reason that you would use the cyclical progesterone in those that are kind of still having periods or not yet at that one year past their last menopause or their, their last period is that the endometrium is thought to be quite unstable because of all the hormone fluctuations and all you're trying to do is kind of regulate the bleeding a bit so rather than them naturally having quite chaotic bleeding patterns the progesterone for two weeks of the month just gives them a kind of more scheduled bleed that they know when it's coming and they've got a bit more control over whereas the marina is kind of dealing with that unstable endometrium in a, in a different way. Cool, okay, thanks. Any other questions? Have you got any advice about um, previous migraine or um, VTE? Um, and HRT. So um, migraine actually is not a contraindication to HRT at all, but the transdermal estrogen is recommended rather than oral. Um, and in terms of kind of recurrent 
DVT and PE. So you can actually use the transdermal um, estrogen as well. It's just the oral routes that go through first pass and affect your clotting factors increase the risk. Um, but actually transdermal routes are safe in both. Great. Well, can I just ask a question about when to switch to continuous? So say if you've got a woman on a, on a patch and a micronized cyclical progesterone, yeah. when would you switch to continuous? Just after a year? Yeah, so you can do it at a year um, if they're happy to, or if they are um, with the risk that putting them on continuous, they may just have a little bit of bleeding. If they can tolerate that, it should settle over kind of three to six months. If they're happy on their cyclical regimen, then you can actually continue it up to age 54 if they wanted to. So some, I guess some people just quite like that they are having scheduled bleeding and they know when it's going to happen, etc. cetera. Um, if they are very much willing or wanting to get rid of any bleeding at all, then yeah, after one year on the cyclical, you can switch them over to the continuous and just kind of see how they get on. And if they went through menopause quite young, so say if they went through at kind of 43, um, would you switch them then at 44? Say if you'd started cyclical, that would be okay? Yeah, that would be fine. Yeah, if they've had a year of cyclical, then it's very reasonable to try switch them over. And if they have really heavy bleeding when they withdraw from their cyclical progesterone, what would you do? So you can either kind of just watch and wait and see if it settles. You could try increasing the dose of the utrogestan. So try doubling it up and see if that settles it. Um, or you could try a different, slightly more old-fashioned progesterone. So your um, Provera, which is hydroxyl progesterone, is probably the one that has the best effect for bleeding. So you could always try that for a few months. If everything settles down, then maybe very cautiously swap over to the slightly safer micronized progesterone. And would you ever use things like tranexamic acid for that kind of first day of the bleed? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You could. Um, so you'd want to do kind of 1.5 grams um, three times a day for your tranexamic acid. And although the BNS says you can use it only up to four days, you can use it at the higher dose for four days and then you can kind of extend it slightly on an off license dose. Um, so either 0.5 or one gram for a further three days if they're having kind of quite prolonged heavy bleeding. But yeah, that's a, that's a really good option, actually. Um, and then, sorry, one more question. Um, do you ever get people on the combined pill come in with kind of vasomotor symptoms? I never know what to do with them because in theory, they're having really high doses of estrogen on the pill, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. Um, so they are, um, but it, it is slightly different estrogens that are used in the combined pill compared to what you get in HRT. Um, so if they're struggling with vasomotor symptoms, I suppose your two options are that you swap them over to HRT um, completely. So you, but you'd still have to think of something for contraception. So you could kind of do a bit of a good sell for a marina plus a form of estrogen and see, see if they'd be willing to have that option. Or you could even think about kind of the SSRI route if they're very keen on their um, their combined pill. Um, I guess you, you just know that you can't add in HRT on top of the combined pill. So they will have to do some sort of swap, um, particularly for trial of combined pill plus SSRI isn't helping. You could add in HRT on top of the pop. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. OK, thank you. That was so helpful. Anything else, guys? Um, Helen, can I just ask? Um, hi, can I ask? I've got a patient who had an endometrial ablation, mm -hmm. um, and then she now wants HRT. So does that mean that I can I only have to give her estrogen because she doesn't need the progesterone protective part for the uterus? So sadly, not. So she's oh, got progesterone. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So estrogen can um, kind of reproliferate almost the uterus. Um, so they still sadly need the progesterone. They need both. Okay, because one of my other colleagues said it was just estrogen. So they do need both. I really think they need both. Yeah, I think it's literally okay. if the womb is removed and, and in its entirety, yeah, can we yeah. get around the progesterone part. Okay, so she needs both. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Can I ask one more question? Sorry, yeah, Helen. You've got one. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you're if you're going if you want if they want a progesterone only if they want contraception as well can you give yeah. them the estrogen patch plus the progesterone only pill or do you have to give them the micronized progesterone and the progesterone only pill? Yeah, you have to do both. Um, so there is some off license use of uh, Cerazet, but we wouldn't be able to do it. Menop I think people kind of with menopause specialist qualifications can kind of double up the 
um, dose of Cerizet and use that as endometrial progesterone. But actually for us, we would have to do micronized progesterone, a yes. form of estrogen plus a pop, sadly. But that might change over the next few years. Cool, thanks. But there's no risk that we know of in terms of doing that. And that's following the guidance, I guess, so we kind of have to. Great. Hopefully, hopefully that was helpful. Um, cool. Well, if anybody doesn't want to talk to me about genomics or um, anything else, then I will let you guys go. Thanks. Nice to see some familiar faces. And um, good luck. So, are you guys all finishing in August? Sometime around then, maybe. I finish on the 7th of July. Oh, exciting. <laughs> Very good. Where are you going after your training, Lorna? Um, Crediton. Nice. I'm actually on the 7th of July as well, so it's literally... <laughs> Very exciting. Great. Okay, cool. Well, um, thanks for listening to me rattle on for a little bit. Um, oh, hold on. There's there something in the chat that I haven't answered. Uh, yes. I will make sure the signs get to you. Um, can you get perimenopausal symptoms on the combined pill? Yes. So if the estrogen dose isn't enough from your combined pill, then you definitely can get menopausal symptoms. So that would be a kind of time to think about just swapping over to HRT where you can then adjust the dose of estrogen um, to kind of tackle the symptoms. But the combined pill is a good option um, kind of if you're slightly more early to mid 40s with um not that severe symptoms so maybe more of like a bit of um a bit of kind of funny mood a bit of anxiety kind of pm pms type symptoms actually that can be really helped by the combined pill